Now, turning to the costs, or the blemishes. And I appreciated the question earlier today, the person who quoted A. Brilloff who said, this sounds like a love fest. Where, where, where are the blemishes? Where are the downside? And I have to tell you, one of the reasons I started this new project about the blemishes is because during my book tour on Berkshire Beyond Buffett, I got that question all the time. And so I was talking about some of the downsides, some of the costs, uh, but I decided to articulate them uh, categorically in a single place. And uh, I'll start this section with a quote from Warren. He acknowledges that there are costs of the Berkshire model, but he says, quote, we would rather suffer the, suffer the visible costs of a few bad decisions than incur the many invisible costs that come from decisions made too slowly or not at all because of a stifling bureaucracy. And most of these costs, as I suggested when I quoted Stephanie, derived from the exact same features that produce such substantial gains and such huge value at Berkshire. So it's not easy to change these things without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But it's, it's this. This is a giant conglomerate, an industrial corporation, one of the largest, and yet still operated and still animated by this spirit of a small, traditional, old-fashioned partnership. So the most visible costs of the Berkshire model appear in capital allocation principally acquisitions and investments. Warren relies on himself in making these decisions without executives, oversight, or, or, or board input. Uh, and most of these decisions have succeeded, many of them spectacularly. The long run gain is extraordinary. Um, but there have been some bloopers, starting with Berkshire itself, which was a doozy, um, but including Gen Ray, uh, which had some uh, opaque derivatives businesses and um, really would have gone bankrupt in, on, after 9-11 if, if it hadn't been for Berkshire, and uh, Dexter Shoe, which turned out to be a, a colossal uh, loss. And these, these costs uh, from self-reliance could readily, readily be mitigated by distributing the decision-making power just a little bit more broadly beyond one person, and Warren does that quite often when he enlists Warren's, uh, Charlie's advice. Uh, Carol joked this morning that Warren calls Charlie the abominable no man because Warren does tend to run opportunities by uh, Charlie and he will green light him or say that's a terrible idea and it, and it won't be done. But Warren doesn't do that every single time and as has been suggested, Warren and Charlie think so much all the time that another filter might be useful. And certainly this has not been a problem remotely for Berkshire under Warren and Charlie but it's the kind of thing that successors will probably want to adjust a little bit to distribute decision-making power a little bit more broadly, and that's precisely what the Berkshire succession plan contemplates. The most dramatic costs of the Berkshire model arise from executive departures and succession at the subsidiaries. And while most Berkshire managers have excelled, and the company generally retains managers for lengthy tenures and is pretty famous for lengthy tenures, there have been exceptions. And some of those exceptions have been particularly um, costly. They are perceived to signal serious crisis uh, at a particular company and perceived to reflect on some of the limits of the Berkshire model. Those costs have been particularly acute when they involve people who were widely portrayed and perceived as being likely successors to Warren as CEO, including David Sokol and Rick Santulli. Yeah, the drama of the Berkshire executive succession uh, problem arises in part from Warren being the sole decision maker. But they are magnified by Berkshire's lack of formal executive vetting or training or review. Again, uh, this has not been net a serious problem at Berkshire and Warren has been quite adept at, at navigating it. But it's something that the, subsidi that the successors will have to pay a great, greater deal of attention to, and it is probably wise for Warren to begin a process of, of, of promoting greater interaction among the subsidiary CEOs than has been historically true. And my impression, anecdotal and based on some observations, is there's a little bit more conversation and coordination among the CEOs than there has ever been in the past. And I think that that will probably need to intensify uh, once Warren and Charlie leave the scene. Uh, third uh, is uh, Berkshire's decentralized structure uh, does impose some costs on uh, other constituencies, including customers 
uh, and employees. At a, at a sprawling organization like this with, with at, at least 60 or 80 main subsidiaries, and hundreds and hundreds of additional business units all around the world employing nearly 350,000 people, you are going to have some problems. There are going to be some um, uh, policy violations uh, in, of people who don't get the, the newspaper test and, and make mistakes. Uh, there are uh, among the known historical examples at specific Berkshire businesses have been questionable practices of the distributors, of some distributors of the Kirby vacuum system, as well as some um, poor conditions at manufacturing facilities overseas of the Fruit of the Loom Company. You've, you've heard today a couple of times references uh, to in investees in which Berkshire holds positions, such as uh, Bill Ackman's observations about what Coca Cola really is questions about uh, not just 3G's presence at, at, in Berkshire, but some of the companies that, uh, that it has uh, brought into Berkshire, especially Kraft, which uh, produces uh, uh, processed food that, that attracts uh, critics. But you're, you're going to find these kinds of costs uh, percolating at a, at a sprawling huge organization like this. And again, historic, with Warren and Charlie at the helm, these have been uh, modest and, and totally tolerable. But again, once they leave the scene, I think Berkshire is going to need to invest incrementally more in some level of internal control and reporting that they haven't needed to do in the past. Again, you've got to be careful not to bureaucratize this, this organization, but some, some modest adjustments are probably going to be needed. And finally, uh, a very subtle set of costs arise from Berkshire's uh, hyper-decentralization and thriftiness that leaves it without a centralized public relations or, or communications function. Um, and Bill Ackman again was talking today about how immune Berkshire has been from uh, being a target of political uh, attacks and in, in general the, the, the holding company, the parent company has been immune but there have been quite a few assaults on, on, on several of the subsidiaries including as Jason Zweig suggested uh, against Clayton Holmes earlier this year and against National Indemnity last year and um, and the companies responded to these, uh, these attacks, but, but only ex post and in ways that didn't necessarily uh, leave the public record in a, in a favorable way. And it's my own thought that uh, this is at least in part because when, Warren, when Berkshire acquires a company, it tells the managers they won't be responsible for that kind of public interaction anymore. They don't have to deal with analyst pressures for sure, and they don't have to deal with these other kinds of uh, public relations things. But uh, that makes them juicy targets for, for, for journalists seeking to uh, notch a few, uh, you know, to, to do an expose. And that's what the Clayton Holmes piece uh, ended up looking like. That's what the National Indemnity piece ended up looking like. But Berkshire, those subsidiaries in particular, seemed to be caught a little bit, they looked like they were caught a little bit flat-footed. And so I think it would uh, be a good idea, I, I think this would even be a good idea now, but despite Warren being a great communicator, to, to hire a professional public relations or communications person who can try to get ahead of those kinds of stories. Uh, both, reporters of both of those stories contacted the companies, um, but, but uh, I, I think a, a professional assigned to that task would have, would have, would have uh, helped to shape a different narrative than the one that uh, appears in those, in those stories. And certainly, again, once Warren and Charlie leave the scene, I think that uh, the, the new team will, will probably include such, a, such an expert at, at, at communications. And this is partly designed to address some of the points that people are making, that Warren has managed to combine six different skill sets in one person. And uh, that's just going to be very hard for any single person to, to, to replicate. So, so in some ways, these are modest quibbles. And uh, I'll just conclude on this note uh, by stressing again that the, I call the piece strengths and blemishes. And I want to emphasize that the, the, the value has massively outweighed uh, the costs and the model is clear and proven both in the hunt for acquisitions how acquisitions are vetted and then in this oversight uh, and delegation of, of managerial stewardship once um, companies are owned and uh, there's been several references today to the seas candy acquisition from 1972 which is was a milestone and is a remarkable standard uh, especially if we, we reference it more times than any other acquisition uh, today. Yeah, it was rel relatively small. I mean, it was big for Warren at the time, but looking back, it was a relatively small deal, but it defined a lot of the future path of Berkshire Hathaway, including, as you've heard so many times, the shift from thinking about net net or book value or getting things on the cheap to paying up, to paying, paying for quality. Uh, it also um, 
developed a new sense of a new appreciation for the value of franchise businesses and brand strength. And, and it also um, be- began to illustrate, and, and every year, more and more, as Seize Candies generated capital and sent it to Omaha, Omaha for reallocation, it demonstrated more and more the value of that structure in which you can take excess capital from one subsidiary and send it to the other. So C's turned out to be, in hindsight, a, one of the most important acquisitions Berkshire has ever made. Now, 40 years later, I have a hunch that we have just seen another such transformative acquisition that closed earlier this year uh, for Detlov Lewis, the German-based motorcycle apparel manufacturer and seller. Very small deal for Berkshire, $400 million or something like that. The company makes $40 million in earnings. Uh, which is way below the, the threshold. The, the, the threshold for a Berkshire acquisition today is $70 million in earnings. Warren made an exception for that in principal part to make a footprint in Germany, in Europe. It's a, he said it was the opening of a door that Berkshire wants to own many, many, many more wonderful businesses in Germany. Remarkable about the Lewis uh, company is just that how exquisitely it is a Berkshire kind of company. And it reminded me a lot of C's. Um, first of all, the source of the deal was personal networks, friends of friends. It boasts a very strong regional brand. It's very well known among motorcycle enthusiasts in Germany, much as C's was very well known among chocolate lovers in San Francisco. It has a very good reputation among its employees and customers. It attracts a very loyal following in both dimensions. It has no debt. It was founded by a family. It was owned by a family. It was professionally managed. They had a total commitment to the long term. They had considered opportunities to sell to private equity. They rejected it because they didn't like any of the intervention, leverage, short time horizon, and so on. So it's an exquisite Berkshire acquisition. And above all, Berkshire paid a fair price. Not a high price, but definitely not a low price. And it's a great franchise business. So as I look out over the next 20 years or 50 at, at Berkshire, one thing I'm seeing is a, uh, a Berkshire in Europe, a Berkshire that gradually buys more and more of these kinds of business and then larger and larger and larger businesses and uh, does the same kind of thing in Europe over the next 20 or 40 years as it's done here in America while it continues to do here in America what it's done before. And um, if that prophecy is true, I'll look forward to seeing you all at uh, the 70th anniversary in in Frankfurt. Uh, So I'll be happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much for listening. 